David Hocard, um, during the occupation I lived in uh, parents' house, Fulmar Green Road in St Clements. And uh, at the start of the occupation, or just before the occupation, my parents decided, uh, was uh, trying to find, would they stay or would they uh, evacuate to England, like some of the rel our relatives did. And in the end they decided they just bought this house, just had it built, and they weren't going to leave that little house behind. In the meantime, I was uh, sent up to my grandparents and to stay with my grandparents while they mulled it over in their minds. And my first recollection of then was my grandfather taking me down the harbour. And I remember we walked along the walks and there was a, a, a funny little brown boat in. And my grandfather said, oh, that's a scrap iron boat. It wasn't until many, many years later I found it was a, a coaster on a maiden voyage. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was just one of those quirky little things you remember at that, that stage. I oh, see, uh, low water fishing, that was always a, a thing that just, uh, had a good, a reasonable supply of um, fish. And Dad, Dad and I used to go down uh, low tides and get uh, um, small fish in the, in the pond, like rockfish and all that sort of thing, and prawns and that. And also, we, late, a bit later on, we started uh, uh, limpets. And by the end of the occupation, so many people collected limpets on Graves Head Beach that there wasn't any around. They were, they were only sort of right way down, and it took a couple of years for them to catch up again. One day, Dad had been down the beach, and he came back with a nice big fish. And uh, he said he found it, uh, that must got stu uh, stu um, stunned by blasting. But I reckon, he, because the Germans built uh, some big uh, nets in, in, in ovals, so there were two of them on Graves that Beach to catch fish as the tide went out. They got trapped in there, and I reckon he saw one there, and he went in and nicked it. <laughs> But you didn't tell anybody. But <laughs> so we had a nice piece of fish for a couple of days with that, with that big one. Um, as time went on, uh, the firewood that was, was and stuff to, to light our fires was getting very s scarce. And we uh, every morning it was my job to go along the beach at Great Desert. And if I found with a bag and picking up small bits of wood, and if I found a big piece of, uh, of wood, I was to sit on it, and they, they would say, "Well, David's a long time today. I wonder if he's found a piece of wood." And they'd come down looking for me, and if I, they saw me sitting on the beach, <laughs> they would run down and give us a hand to, to ca carry the wood back. It's, you know, it's really valuable get, getting uh, timber off the beach like that, because there's plenty around with so many ships being sunk out in the Atlantic and that's amazing what get washed, washed in. Uh, it came about 1942, they were starting to um, get uh, send peop uh, English born people uh, to camps in Germany and uh, mum's father, a, a, a grandfather, he was actually born in England and his parents brought him to Jersey when he was two and had he not died in 1940, he, uh, they, him and my grandmother would have gone to, to Germany and uh, um, mum said uh, her mother would never have survived that. And uh, we, she was in a sense relieved that he had died when he did, because he died suddenly. So he, he, had no, he suffered no pain at all. It was just sad that he, he, he died. Oh yes, and um, a cousin of my uh, paternal grandfather had a farm at um, St Catherine's. Bel uh, it was a Bel Air farm above St Catherine's, and we used to go out there quite frequently. Uh, we'd have to catch the bus by the tennis courts and go as far as Goree, and that's as far as the buses went, and we had to walk from Goree to St Catherine's to the farm, and we'd spend the day there. Uh, Mum and Dad would be helping in the fields, and I would be sort of playing around everywhere. And strangely enough, he still had his lorry. 
but it was in the, in the shed and I, I used to go in the lorry and pretend I was driving. I, I had great fun in that. And um, we always came back with a, we had a good, good feed there because they had quite a, a few, um, you know, plenty of vegetables and that from the, go from the fields. It was, there was one particular day, it must have been after D-Day, uh, I was with Cousin Jack in the fields and we were moving the cows and all of a sudden there was one hell of a racket of uh, machine gun fire and Jack pushed me, pushed me to the ground and, and laid almost on top of me and this fighter plane flew right, up, right over our heads with the guns from the um, uh, Roselle Mill, there's machine guns on top of the hill and also at the top of um, St Catherine's and uh, we, it was um, an American aircraft, they didn't hit it. It must have been after D-Day because uh, there was quite a lot of Allied planes flying around at that time. And uh, that gave us a, a real scare. And the, the cows didn't seem to, to notice it at all, which was fortunate to us because we were un, under a cow almost. <laughs> And another thing we used to do is um, take a, a, a couple of cans down to the uh, beach when on high tide and collect uh, nice clean seawater to, to cook the vegetables in because there was little or no salt. So we used to cook all our vegetables in um, uh, seawater. Uh, other things on, on the farm. Um, well, parents used to go out and help with the weeding and that because he, he used to grow a lot of different vegetables like carrots and um, parsnips and all that sort of thing. That's for local consumption. And uh, we, always, we always got sent home with a, a bottle of milk and perhaps a couple of eggs uh, for, as, as a thank you for going out there and helping them. I remember seeing the big floating crane, Ante, tied up alongside um, St Catherine's breakwater on one occasion. They, they must have brought her around there to lift some heavy guns onto the breakwater, I should think. It wasn't there very long. I think next time we, we uh, went, she was gone again. Yes, uh, uh, it must have come on a barge uh, from France or somewhere, and they were lifting on, onto the uh, breakwater. Right. It's probably um, guns to go in the uh, various batteries around yeah. that area. It was easier to do that than to um, try and put them on a, a truck and drive yeah. them from St Helia. Uh, one, uh, towards the end of the war, uh, I attended St Luke's school and one play playtime there was an enormous noise explosion and we saw this thick cloud of black smoke come over the school and a whole group of us said, let's go and find where the smoke's come from. And uh, we um, went up out, out the school playground, into Don Road, uh, up into, into Moor Millay. And when we got to Moor Millay, uh, there was ambulances flying backwards and forwards and we weren't allowed to go up that way. So we dodged around the back road and tried to come out again onto Moor Millay further up. But again, we were blocked. So instead of carrying on that we went back and there was a lane went down behind Duro Terrace into um, uh, the valley below and we went down there and went up through some fields and then we could see the whole hotel was the end of the hotel was gone completely flattened and then we, we got back to, to school and just as the school was coming out at 12 o'clock so we just joined everybody else and went home but uh, <laughs> when we got back again at two o'clock it was all the ones that were missing had to go in the headmaster's study <laughs> and uh, we didn't get a caning he, he said we should have deserved it but uh, don't, if you do something like that again don't get caught <laughs> uh, a belgian ship bound from Granville to guernsey called a ship called the diamond and uh, she had uh, all sorts of supplies on and troops and that. And he got as far as a Corbier and he couldn't make no headway against the, the uh, gathering wind and tide. So he turned around and he came, he wanted to come into St. Helier Harbour, but he missed the turning. 
because there was no very few navigation lights on, and he, he ran aground on what's called the Dog's Nest Rocks on the eastern side of the approaches to Sally Harbour. And uh, the, our, our St Helia lifeboat was called out because it remained here under the RNLR secretary the whole of the war. Uh, the Germans tried to use it, but they, they couldn't get the hang of it. And uh, what had to be done then, uh, they called the secretary. The secretary then had to get the police out to go round with their police van and to pick up the crew and then go down and then he had a fight like hell to get a few gallons of petrol for the boat. They went out to the uh, Dalton Nest Rocks, they picked up um, about five or six men and there was some sitting up actually on the beacon. So they couldn't get to it with the lifeboat. So they come back, dropped off the men they picked up, uh, got a dinghy and towed a dinghy out there and two of the lifeboat crew rode into the amongst the rocks and but the, by then there was only I think only five left out of seven but they rescued those five and, and rode them back to the, um, the lifeboat again but it, uh, the lifeboat secretary had a, a deal with their own job to get petrol for the boat sometimes they'd give them a gallon or a gallon and a half well that doesn't last very long <laughs> on, a, on a boat and uh, it, 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 it was the only RNLI lifeboat anywhere uh, that remained under the uh, auspices of the lifeboat secretary. The one in Guernsey was converted to a gunboat, but the one here had been so much smaller, um, wasn't fit, suitable for a gunboat. And it went out on about four or five rescues in the whole of, whole of the war. The lifeboat secretary had a few problems with local people saying, that, oh, you're rescuing Germans, you shouldn't be rescuing Germans. He said the lifeboat's there to rescue anybody who's in difficulty at the sea, no matter what his nationality is. And he was right. This ship, well, she, she got wrecked on the Dog's Nest rocks and she broke up fairly quickly and she was uh, taking lots of food and um, parts of uh, the, these uh, German uh, wooden huts that they built, sort of prefab type huts. And a lot of stuff got washed up, up on Great Desert Beach. And uh, my dad was down there and he came home with a window. <laughs> I don't know why the hell he brought a window home at all for. And uh, we didn't cut it up for firewood. And eventually, after the war, we enlarged the, uh, the, his garden shed and there was a new window in the, in the shed and it was there until, uh, until it, they, they sold the house. Because <laughs> if you've been in, in salt water, that's a, a, a treat any wood that's in, been in salt water for any length of time. It's, it doesn't burn so well. We proved that in, in um, open fires because you get so much stuff off the beach in those days and there was always blue flames, and that was the salt in the wood. Oh yes, the, around the time of, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you in a minute, uh, of the uh, uh, D-Day landings, there was uh, aircraft flying over all the time, and uh, I was home from school, and I was doing something in Dad's shed, and the, um, the anti-aircraft guns here were going at, at the, the aircraft as well, and all of a sudden there's a hell of a clatter on the corrugated iron roof of the shed. And I thought, what the hell's that? Somebody's throwing stones. Now I went outside and I saw this piece of metal on, on the roof. And I'll show you it in a minute. Uh, and I, I got the, the, the steps out and I scrambled onto the roof. And I went to pick it up and I dropped it very quickly because it was hot. It was really, really hot. So I just kicked it onto the, the gravel. And I, I've got that bit of shrapnel to this day. And it was directly above where I was uh, doing something in the shed. I thought, crocky, I'm glad I was inside the shed. Um, I mustn't mention any, any names. A friend of mine said, um, oh, you must come up and see me. He said, I've got a, a, a lovely train set. And uh, this is... Um, so I, I went up, I think it must have been the, the next day or something, I went up and I said, well, I've I come up to see your train set. Oh, he said, we, ca we can't go in yet because mum's got a friend. So all right, so we played football outside and then um, this friend came out and he was a German officer. And uh, I, didn't, didn't, I was innocent in those days 
and uh, off they went, right, he'd come in now and have a look at the train set. And there was this, the mother's friend that had brought this train set back from Germany. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, all the locals had a name for, for ladies like her. Towards the end, end of the, uh, the war, um, there was a lot of robbery going on. This was after D-Day and all that, and the, the Germans were very short, very, very short of food, and so were we. And we had, still had, I think, three hens and a, a bantam. And every night, as soon as it was starting to get dark, Dad had made a big box. You go out and get these three hens and a little bantam. Was, the little bantam was a, a, a pet as much as anything. And we'd bring them in. They, they stayed under the kitchen table all night until the next morning. And we kept our chickens and we still had eggs. <laughs> Shopkeepers and people uh, use a lot of imagination during the war. And I always remember uh, there's a builder in um, Cleveland Road called Ryan, the builders. And he always had wooden toys in the window. And it dawned on me what, what, quite a long time later, because I always wanted to go round past his window to look at his toys he had in the window. And I reckon, I, I've got no proof of this, but I reckon he had his carpenters to keep him employed, making his wooden toys out of odd scraps of wood he had lying around in the workshop. I think Dad did buy me a, 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 a small boat about, about that big, with uh, imitation of a liner or something. One incident um, was uh, Ted Labollis, uh, one of the local pilots. Uh, there was a, a number of ships, or two ships actually, that um, was crewed by Channel Islanders, cargo ships, but they always had a German guard with them, which they brought supplies from France to, to the two islands. One was a Spinel, which is a British boat that had been captured at Dunkirk. And there was a French collier called a Normand. And um, Ted Le Bollestier was master. And there was Silver Lareche, another pilot who was part of the crew. And there was an engineer called uh, Eric. So we used to live just a bungalow down there at one time. And uh, they used to bring mainly supplies for Jersey and Guernsey. But the Germans always squeezed some of their supplies on board as well. And uh, Tez gave us a talk at the Occupation Society once, and he said to um, somebody, said to him, why don't you, when you get to Guernsey, just carry on steaming and get out? He said, it would be fools that have done that. He said, you've lost your supply boat. He said, uh, our families were all in Jersey, and they would have probably been taken out to some camp in France somewhere and ill-treated. Ill and we, we, uh, he said, admitted we only had one guard on board and if we could have easily knocked him on the head, but he said, you know, we had to think of our people and the Jersey people. to go see the Bond Hotel, that's the Palace, Palace Hotel? Palace Hotel, yes. Okay, and that was... That was up... Um, St. Luke's School. It, it was qu quite a way up, about halfway. Um, if you know where the uh, ladies' college is... Uh, is, is it, it, no, no, that's the Catholic one. Uh, you've got the Victoria College one side on Mulmele, and you had the um, college house, and now they built the ladies' college behind that. Well, when the roads merge again, there was a, it's called Palace Close now. There was a big hotel down there, and they'd had, just before the war, they had a huge extension and a swimming pool built. And uh, um, it was a boiler under the new section that blew up, or where the, they, the Germans claimed it was a boiler blew up, but uh, there were rumors that uh, some other Germans had wanted to get out, had planted some something else there, but the, the whole, building was flattened completely. 